first encountered rock when I was about 14 and immediately was totally fascinated because it was so intimate, just you, the rock, on the moment. We climbed a very technical peak and we're just about to get onto the glacier which was flat when all of a sudden we heard this noise up above, little, little noise. And we looked up and there were these little dots bouncing out above us, way, way up at the very top of this 3,000 foot cliff. All of a sudden we realized, oh, that's a rock fall and it's heading this way. And these little things were actually huge boulders. We just pulled ourselves in on the slab, pulled our packs over our heads, because now the boulders were starting to land amongst them. And the noise got so loud, it was just wild, wild noise. There's no, there's no way it's gonna survive this, because there's so many rocks pouring down. So just huddled up on this rock with my eyes closed, and this incredible noise around me, and then started to fade away. We're here on, on this planet to live these most amazing, joyous lives, and it's our fears that keep us confined. My name's Martin Williams, and I grew up in Liverpool, in England. And um, Liverpool's a very dirty, smelly city, so I was always wanting to get out of it, basically, for, for much of my childhood. And in many ways, I guess, that's one of the beauties of adventures. That they, I mean, even the definition of the word is that it is it's something unexpected, something unknown. When I look back at all the things I've done, it's really quite a long list. In terms of peaks, I've climbed probably 30 or so unclimbed peaks around the world. And then I've climbed the highest peak in South America, the highest peak in Australasia, the highest peak in Antarctica a bunch of times. Um, I'm the first person to lead an expedition to the South Pole from one direction. And um, I'm the first person to ski right across Antarctica. Having been so successful and done all these things, I decided to, to change focus. So I got married, actually sold my expedition businesses, and stepped out of that into the role of just being a dad for about almost two years. But in that whole transition process, there was a time there where, because I wasn't in the cities where I was well known, I was a hero back home. Here I was in a, in a city that nobody knew me, um, not doing anything of importance, part of me felt, um, you know, alone, abandoned, um, just a bit lost, you know? And I'd be wondering, well, what am I doing here? When this whole project of going to K2 came up, K2 is the second highest mountain in the world, and it's it's a very difficult mountain, so it's, it's a great mountaineering challenge. It, we ended up that my best friend decided to go, and I decided to stay. And then on the mountain itself, he reached the summit, but then on the way down from the summit, he fell. Five close friends in all different disciplines died in about a year and a half. And so in that one year, all these friends who are top professionals, you know, supposedly knew all, all the safety procedures, trained people in safety, all that stuff, all died. And every time they died, emotionally, there was a strong hit for me. And um, so that triggered a whole thought about, I mean, it wasn't a conscious thought about mortality, but energetically, something resonated in me. One night I had a dream and um, I realized that of all the great adventures, there were still some undone. And that one of them was from by going to the North Pole to the South Pole under human power. So I woke up next morning with this idea and said, you know, that's a great idea. And then about a midday, this light bulb went off. And I realized that it wouldn't have to be the world's best explorers. 
it could be a group of young people doing this journey as long as they had a burning passion about doing the journey. This idea sort of filled me up with enthusiasm and with total sense that this was a beautiful project. This is what I should be doing next. So having conceived the project, then I then started working on it. The next phase was to let more people know about it. This triggered in me this incredible fear of picking up the phone and sharing this idea with other people. So I was literally avoiding this, you know, making the phone calls. Meanwhile, the vision would die unless I made the phone calls. It's really interesting how deep-seated those fears can be and how these fears can actually, maybe because of those fears, I was running away into the mountains for many years. So what I did, I'd, I'd actually create a visualization in my mind's eye of the, the team at the South Pole. I would connect in with that vision. So as soon as it built up to really, really excited, at that moment I'd reach out, grab the phone and make the calls. <laughs> so then having, having got all the money, I had to pull the team together in, in a month and, um, and then do the training in six weeks. And go as fast as you can. And the specifics of it were that we were going to come from the North Pole into Canada, side bicycle through Canada, and then into the US, through Central America, South America, and then get into Antarctica, and then ski to the South Pole. on the first leg of the journey. They started off with great enthusiasm. Okay. Come on, Jay. The first leg was extremely difficult. There were other teams that, that didn't do it, that weren't trying to do the whole journey that we were doing, but just do that North Pole segment. There were other teams that didn't do it. And our team did it, and, and when I met, when I saw them, they were just so radiant. I could just see them glowing, getting stronger, more confident, more capable, all that sort of stuff. Then, through North America, what happened is that we got into the more of the routine and the rhythm. It's almost like they lost the vision and they got caught up in the day-to-day -day. and they were more grumpy with each other, their vibrancy had gone and uh, it really looked like the team was almost falling apart. One of the team members, Dylan, had a bike accident and was knocked unconscious. So then the team members were all, wow. It was a real wake-up call to the whole team members of, what are we doing this for? Why are we doing this? So there's this big moment of what to do now. In South America, it seemed like the team became re-energized individually. People connected in again, why am I doing this? They knew why they're doing it, and they, they then started acting from that place. We came across so many neat projects that it was just sparked with one person's bright idea, taking action, led to this multiplier effect, a whole ripple effect that would, would change a whole community. So we're now into, nine, into eight months. Now we're into Antarctica, trekking across Antarctica. And we're traveling into a headwind every day and the wind's blowing at 
10 to 15 miles an hour. It's minus 40. Dylan, who was the strongest team member, developed pneumonia and came to me and said, I can't pull my sled anymore. And for Dylan to say that was a big, big statement because he was a big strapping guy and he just, he knew how to push himself totally to the limit, you know? And then Devlin, who was the second strongest, he'd also developed pneumonia too. So now he had these two strongest guys. And then the next day, Mercedes, who's the strongest woman, now has developed a foot injury. So we got three of the, three of the strongest members out and, and it's really looking rough. And so what happens though is the, the, the weakest team members who've always needed support, they come up and say, no, we're going to do this. We're not going to stop now. And so there was Mercedes walking on the snow um, in little camp booties because she, she couldn't put her feet in the ski boots. And here, right next to her was this far weaker team member struggling along with this huge sled, <laughs> you know, just grunting along hour after hour after hour. It was, it was a very, very beautiful, very poignant moment on the whole journey. When we finally did see the South Pole and we, we knew we were going to get there, that day we had so much energy. <laughs> we skied alongside each other and we were just laughing and joking and pushing each other over and giggling. It was minus 40. And actually, at the very last minute, the United Nations had, had come in to support us on the project because we'd been collecting promises of action from young people. And then we heard the United Nations had collected 63 million promises to give to us too. Here we were now going to reach this millennium, reach this new millennium, and deliver what we, what we thought we wanted to deliver. And it's going to be way bigger than we ever thought. On Everest, I was guiding a group of six climbers. I set out late one afternoon from, from one of the high camps, heading up towards the summit. Unfortunately, I had some food from some Spanish climbers at the camp, and the food gave me food poisoning. So I start vomiting and diarrhea, so I do all that, and sit down on the snow and realize, you know, this is it, I'm not going to go any higher. But at that moment, all of a sudden, I look around and I realize, wow, what an amazing place to be. I stayed there for about half an hour just you know, yipping and howling and just really you know, just in awe of life, really, in awe of the beauty. One of the reasons that I didn't feel remorse is that I think because I knew I'd done absolutely everything I could. You know, I'd driven my body to, to the limits, you know, to the physical limits. Those moments of this is it and wow, I could, you know, I'm about to die or could die propels me to be more appreciative of being alive. I'd definitely say, um, don't get stopped in, in what your dreams are. Just go for your dreams to the maximum. And even if you end up as a bum on the street, it's worthwhile doing because if you put so much into it, you'll feel great anyway. And so just shed you know, the aspect of, of I'm constrained by my fears and just you know, live life totally and it's the most beautiful thing to do. It just, um, things flower, you know, things constantly flower, miracles happen, um, plus you have a great time.